Welcome, gentlemen, on the show. Michael, you were the captain of England when uh, KP made his debut. When's the first time you saw him and what is the first impression you got of KP? And did you ever know that this man will go on to become such a colourful personality? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first time, actually, was in 99 uh, when I toured there with England. He was playing for Natal in Durban. Bowling his offspin. Got me out. <laughs> <laughs> got me out. But I don't know, what, eight or nine? Eight or nine, I think he got a 50 in the second innings. Didn't really think much of his batting. Thought he bowled quite nice off spin. And he came into the, the team um, for the tour to Zimbabwe, South Africa. And I'd not really seen him live. I'd seen him on some, some videos and I'd obviously seen his scores. Uh, and we had this middle practice. I think he might have been in Botswana or somewhere like that. I don't know where it was. <laughs> Vintuk, wasn't it? Vintuk, somewhere Vintuk. like that. We were in Vintuk. In Namibia. And I was with Duncan Fletcher, the coach, and he goes out for this middle practice. And he placed his first 10 balls, he was useless. <laughs> and I looked at Duncan, I went, what have we picked here? <laughs> I said, he can't hit it straight. I said, he just whips it across that pad. I said, he's useless. And Duncan's looking at me going, oh, he'll settle, he'll settle. I said, well, he better do. I said, we've put our, our hopes on this chap. <laughs> but you had a scary debut. I mean, so many people mm. booing. I mean, I've been a comedian, <laughs> so I know what heckling means. And <laughs> it's like going for your gig and only 50,000 hecklers. And you went there, I would have gone back Jeez. into the dressing room. But yeah. you went there, but, and somewhere you've written, I think, that Michael Vaughan played a very important role in getting the team motivated and saying that, you yeah, know, well, we've got to support it was, it was obviously, I mean, it, it just, a, it just a, a case of lobbing him into the deep end and saying, can you swim? Because uh, being from South Africa and then being sent back to Southern Africa for my first trip to so Zimbabwe, we were my first couple of tasters, but that was easy. That was just beautiful. Played up there in Harare and Bulawayo with a little pre-tour in in Vintuk, but then um, the baptism of fire, and I think I was, well I was, I was batting with Vaughny when I walked out to bat at uh, the bull ring, and I think the noise, if you, if you add up the decibels of that, that, uh, that bull ring for that 20 minutes that we batted, thank goodness it rained and, and the game was called <laughs> off, but you add up all the decibels there just for that 20 minutes, it would never ever add up. Every single boo that I got in Australia, in South Africa, the rest of my whole career wouldn't add up to the decibels and the levels at wow. which I got abused there. But, I mean, the team environment that we played in, and, and, and I always say that it's the best team that I ever played in the first three, four, five years of my career because you could feel like there was a genuine um, team spirit. And the way that you went into the huddle and we were warming up in Durban and my first game in Durban and Vaughnie and Gareth Batty, another the off spinner. I mean, they just said, they said, if, we, if anyone gives it to him today, we're going to give it back twice as, twice as much. Wow. And so that kind of stuff just helped me just sort of settle into the team. Vicar, but I, I have to say that I look back at that and think, what the hell was I protecting him for? <laughs> What was I doing? He should have just he, let him get out there and get the booze. It's the only time I've seen him scared. Yeah? The only time. Yeah, I was, uh, it was rabbit in headlights for sure. Michael always mentioned that captaincy is about man management, nothing else. And uh, you take pride in the fact that you manage your players well. So I'm going to put you on a spot. Give you a name, a few names about two players who I think you manage decently. Uh, Kevin, step in if he's uh, not telling the truth. I will. I always have done. <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve Harmison. Steve Harmison. Well, oh, I mean, he, he was great on his day. Um, how did you manage Steve Harmison? Well, it was quite easy. Just talk about Newcastle United. <laughs> <laughs> Give him a pint of lager. <laughs> sit him down, discuss football, take his mind off it. Make sure he's got an adjoining room with Freddie Flintoff. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, not many that. people know, but both of those two are scared of the dark. It's <laughs> <laughs> absolutely true, Kev. So a lot of my, so Campsy for me, of course, there's a, there's a lot of it about tactics and strategies, but I do believe in leadership is, is about the people. It's about understanding, not just the cricketer, it's about the person. So go out your way to make sure that you know who the person was. And I worked out pretty quickly that Steve Harms and Freddie Flintoff were like that. Mm. So I needed them close together all the time. So I would have meetings with the team manager, Phil Neal, and a lot of the meetings were about hotels. Was there an adjoining room mm. that Freddie and Steve Harmison? Yeah, but it's on the first floor and it'll be, I don't care. They've got to be in there. And that door would be open 24-7. And they'd have, it'd be like <clears throat> the cinema, wasn't it? Mm. Cinema with like Haribos and Coca-Cola, you name it. It had everything in there, big screen for the TV. And that was them together. They just were, keep them happy. Just keep, and I'm a big believer in that, in, in management, that 
you know, I think the players are under so much pressure that you've got to look after the person. Wow. You know, the, the cricket, I know that the, the cricketer averages 45, he bats right-handed or he bowls left arm over, but, you know, I as a captain need to know who that person was. And I always felt if I knew them more off the pitch, on the pitch, I could react a little bit better to them if I knew them off the pitch. Um, so Steve Harmison was, was, was easy. The hard bit for Steve was getting on a plane. Oh, he was scared he of flying. Yeah, he didn't like flying. <laughs> a funny story, we went to New Zealand in two, six, seven, seven, my last tour. And we get down to New Zealand, it's a long way from England, right? And the day before the first test in Hamilton, there was a, a little bit of a debate whether Steve and Matthew Argus should play. And Broad and Anderson were on the tour, should they be playing? And I stayed loyal with my senior pair and I thought, you know, I'll give them one game. Give them one last game. If they come up trumps, great. If not, I'll go with the two younger players. And the night before, he knocks on my door. And Steve had never knocked on my door. I said, Steve, what's your problem? He said, uh, you use Gunnar Moore, don't you? I went, Steve, brilliant observation. I said, what's your issue? He said, tomorrow, can I borrow your pads? <laughs> I said, you what? He said, uh, I forgot my pads. <laughs> We'd been there for two and a half weeks. And because we played warm up games, he had not really batted. He gets to the last moment before the test might start on to ask whether he... And I said, Steve, do you know when you go through the airport, what is that box that you carry through the airport? He said, oh, that's my dartboard. <laughs> <laughs> that Takes is his funny. dartboard, but not his pads to New Zealand. Gold dust, an oh. absolute gem. He was a bowler, though. He was a bowler. <laughs> yeah, You've got, yeah, got to give him some slack. But managing Kevin Peterson? Or did Kevin Peterson manage his captains? When I was under Vaughan's leadership and Duncan Fletcher, it was the happiest time that I ever played cricket for England because we all just got on and um, we had fun and we trained well. And I think Fletcher and Vaughan got me uh, in terms of just go and do your thing. Not, they didn't pressure me. They didn't say, you've got to do this. You have to do this. Why haven't you done this? finish a one-day game and they make you do sprints around a cricket field. Um, and I, they, I couldn't sprint, that was the reason why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just, and just that, 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 that constant, uh, that constant uh, pressure of, like, like he's just said now, the amount of pressure that you're on in international cricket, it is just the weight of expectation, the, 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 the deal with all the um, commitments off the field. When you get into that team environment, the pressure should be off. It should be the most relaxed environment. Just go and enjoy yourself. Go and have some fun. Let's, we're going to train properly. We know you train properly, so I don't need to pressure you. Say, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. You just have a laugh with me. You just yeah, have a laugh. The, the, the skill in managing the individual. You know, the, the, the talking teams, you know, and the culture. Yeah, of course, you need a, a culture in a team, but cricket's a unique sport where it's the individual that plays and it's only mm. that one person it's only Kev can face the ball or I can face the ball catch the ball, I didn't catch many but try and catch the ball <laughs> bowl the ball <clears throat> and I think in cricket there's so much talk of this ethic and this culture that you forget that it's about the individual really manage that individual player and I always laugh at people and say oh, you, you got Kevin at the, the best time you know he had everything to prove I go Let's be, Kev's always been an idiot <laughs> but it's about managing the idiot you know, and if you can manage him and understand him, as he said, he just wanted to know. He, he was a nosy bugger. He wanted to know when the coach was leaving, why we were doing this, what kit was going to be worn the week after, why we were wearing that colour, why are we staying in that hotel? And we just say, yeah, give him an answer. And if you gave him the answer, he was fine. You know, wow. if, he, if, if he didn't and he were quiet with him, you knew there was going to be a few issues because he was just, I don't know, is it OCD? Is that what you are? No, I'm just a structured person and I like, I like structure and I like to understand. Like, I've been going, dealing with something in the, in the car now where... Somebody's not answering, and I just like I just have to get this because I'm thinking so far ahead. Like, it's just it's it's just me. It's just what I do. I just like to know what's happening next week, the week after. I just like structure. Nice. I don't I don't like wishy washiness. I'm just it's just the way I'm wired. Let's talk about some India stories now. And I remember one big story that's the jelly bean incident in 2007, <laughs> and the allegation was English players threw jelly beans at Indian batsmen, and I've never seen Zahir Khan angry. Ever. <laughs> I think he's Zen and he doesn't get angry, but even he got angry and India won the match. Well, first and foremost, uh, your opinion of Zahir Khan is completely wrong. Uh, yeah. He was probably the angriest bowler that I ever faced. Very angry. He wow. and uh, I'd say Glenn McGrath. Glenn McGrath more so in just aggression, just abuse. If you hit him for four, he didn't like it. Zahir Khan was right in my face. I don't know, was it in yours? Even, even when he was fielding, Sri Sant bowled me a beamer at Trent Bridge once. That's the same, same game. Same game. Yeah. I think if maybe just hot-headed and a little bit irritable that te test match. But 
My goodness, I would expect a true saint to say something, but Zahir Khan from Medan absolutely flew at me, <laughs> like properly flew at me. I mean, uh, the incident with the jelly beans, I, I thought it was a bit blown out of proportion. They're nice, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't you want a jelly bean? We played the Westerners, was it that same year? Marlon Samuels at Durham and at Jelly Baby. At four, and a similar thing had happened. The drinks come out. Uh, a few sweets hand. It was in the day where sweets apparently made the ball swing. Uh, Triscothic lollies. Yeah, Triscothic. Just you just like he just eating. Like, he just like food. <laughs> it's a, you know, he's a hungry trap. And a jelly babe was on the pitch at Durham, and Marlon Samuel just took his helmet off and just ate. <laughs> it's, and it that's is, exactly what the how... Indian. Well, I should have just yeah. picked it up and had a nice little nibble on it. It is weird how that ended up being such a big story. Yeah. Like really weird. Like I think on the front page of the back pages of papers, there were jelly beans. Like who was it? Like they were swapping our heads for exactly. For Even sweets, in India, we saw all newspapers were full of the jelly bean incident, and I was like, something must have happened. Zahir Khan angry, and now you told me something which is that is go gardening. India needs to know. <laughs> that is go gardening all the time. So if there's a loose bit of turf up anywhere in your landing zone, then you think you're going to go and knock it down. So if there's a sweet there, I mean, I don't think there was anything intended. I mean. You're not that stupid that a bowl is running down and you cannot see that there's in your line of sight. So if there's something there, you're going to wash it or skip it away. So it was definitely not a tactic. It was a slow news week. Yeah. <laughs> it had to be a slow news week. That jelly... I think they're detracting from the fact that we were getting clubbed because yeah, India beat us. Yeah, they beat yeah. us on that occasion. Beat yes, us well. yes. And uh, my story is that everybody got motivated because of this and that's why they beat you. But maybe that's not the truth anymore. Maybe that's just Might a little bit of a deviation. Might be something to do with Zaya Khan swinging it around corners. Yeah. <laughs> is it true that you consulted Rahul Dravid once uh, yeah. to understand how to play spin mm. bowling in India? Yeah, I did. It, well, not in India, all over the world. <laughs> because DRS had just come into the game and I was a very leg side dominant player. And I... Um, Love to hit the ball through the leg side, and I played beautifully against Warney and against some of the best spinners in the world, the Vittoris and Murrellis, and I kept hitting them through the leg side. But because I'm six foot four, every time I got my foot down there before DRS, too far forward, not out. Then DRS came in, and I started getting given out, out LBW, out LBW, out LBW. So I had to change the whole way that I played spin, and I wasn't good enough to think about it and to figure it out. And so, luckily, with the invention of the IPL and my friendships that I created with Dravid and Kumble and Callis and all those guys down in Bangalore um, from a personal level. I was able to call Raul and say, brother, how on earth do you play spin? What you am I doing wrong? You can't call Rahul Dravid brother. Oh, I did. I did. <laughs> he's Mr. Rahul. He is. He is. Yes, he's also a mate. <laughs> and he's a, he's, a, he's a great mate. And I look up to him so much. I mean, I wrote that email that email and I put it in my book because of how generous and how kind it was. I mean, he didn't have to do it, but he went into so much detail on, um, on how to play spin. It was just amazing. I just read that email and I was just like, wow. And then I went and practiced it. And luckily enough, I was skillful enough to, to put it into practice. Well, what a wonderful story. Two English greats and we've got to talk about your very close friends, the Australians, <laughs> which means uh, the Ashes as well. Uh, we'll start with you, Michael. So many incidents must have happened in 2005 Ashes where your very dear friend Ricky Ponting uh, must have said something to you, must have needled you. We want a couple of juicy stories from you, especially in the context of the Ashes. Oh, I mean, uh, the first day at uh, Lords, I think, uh, it was uh, an amazing occasion because expectation was there from the England supporters that we had a team that potentially could just frighten the Australians and we bowled first and Steve Harmison ran in, drew a bit of blood. And Ricky Ponting got hit and there was blood coming out. We kind of walked closely to say, you all right? And he just brushed us away. And people thought we'd not even gone to say if he was all right. It was basically, he'd just gone like that, get rid of the English. We don't need you to say how, you know, if we're doing all right or not. We bowled him out, we got to bat. But as he was batting, I was stood at always at mid-on and mid-off. Used to hide in the field. And we had a, had a bit of an objective of a team to fling the ball into the keeper. So when we got the ball in the field, you just throw it into Girant Jones. We just felt it was a better buzz for the team. Now, Ricky felt that we were throwing it at him. So the ball that I was throwing from mid-on and mid-off, I'd just whip it in and it kind of, Ricky would have to duck a few times. And he <laughs> thought I was throwing it at him. Now, he'd obviously not been studying my feeling because I, I couldn't aim that, that closely <laughs> to hit Ricky Ponting. So I went out to take my guard. I'm taking my guard you know, late afternoon because we'd lost a couple of uh, early wickets. 
my grass blowing for a minute and Ricky Ponting is just stormed to me and, and giving me the biggest volley. <laughs> and I'm looking at Rick going, you know, you're my hero. <laughs> I absolutely, I idolise this chap, but I'm gonna have to go toe to toe for the whole, whole summer. But someone had told me in Australia that if you could wind Ricky Ponting up, he would explode eventually. Wow. Someone pre-series, I wouldn't say they'd written a document, uh, like a document on, on the Aussies, but give me a few little tips on, on what to do to certain individuals. And one of the tips to Ricky Bond was try and wind him up. Wow. Now, throughout the whole series, if you go back to the fourth test match at Trent Bridge, where we'd been prodding Ricky a little bit with a few tactical things, and I think the fact that we'd used the, the odd subfielder had wound him up a little <laughs> yes. bit. That's and then really Gary Pratt him ran him out at Trent Bridge, and then he pointed to the dressing room that to was Duncan nice and Fletcher. I remember winning at Trent Bridge, and as I drove back to the hotel, the person that wrote me that document rings me on the phone, and he just said, I told you to wind Ricky Ponting up. Wow, that is unbelievable. <laughs> there was another story, story the, second, uh, the second test at uh, Edgebaston, we all wanted to bat first. We needed to bat first against Australia because we didn't want to be chasing against Shane Warne. Um, Glenn McGrath tripped over the ball. I've never seen an England team celebrate so much at <laughs> half nine in the morning or giving low fives. That was marvellous. Sorry, Glenn, but that was marvellous to see you on a stretcher just for that one game. Uh, and then I walked out the toss and there's a little bit of advice for like captaincy. And when you see the two captains out in the middle for the toss, you can always tell the desperate captain. So I tossed the coin high and I used to do it just for a bit of a giggle, lob it as high as I could and it trickled down the pitch. Now this is the desperate captain, right. the captain that chases after the coin. <laughs> That's me. I've chased after the coin, nearly pulled my hammy. And then going back to Ricky and Ricky said, oh, we'll have a ball. Well, I've never grabbed a captain stand as quick in all my time. I went, get here. <laughs> Come here. Thank you very much. We'll have a bat. Uh, and then on that day, we scored 480 overs. Yeah. Yep. I always remember it. And we went out to field and it rained, so we didn't bowl a ball. Got in the dress room, I'm thinking, you beauty, we're in the game. We got 400. Shower change, and I go into the car park, and it's by the ground at the Colts uh, cricket ground. Getting in my car, and as I'm getting in my car, Jeffrey Boycott walks past me. I always remember it. He walks past me, he's got that stupid hat on. <laughs> and he just looks at me and goes, ah, skipper, entertaining stuff, that, but you won't win cricket matches batting like that. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember that Sunday when it gets down to 30 to 20, people say, oh, what were you thinking? All I could think about was Jeffrey Boycott. <laughs> thinking, please win, so I could just go and shake his hand. But, that yeah, is great funny. times. That is funny. Warney was a good friend of yours, but something happened, just like his bowling, he went the other way. Shane Warne? Yes. Yeah, so... Warney in 2005 was fun, jovial, uh, friendly, and he copped the brunt of that drop catch. Now, Hayden obviously dropped me just before that, and because it was Shane Warne, he gets all the publicity that surrounds it. But throughout that series, I'd had a laugh and a joke. It was my first series. I don't think Warne thought that I could bat the way that I actually did play, and I was lucky enough to do what I did in that series. But the Australians, with his being, him being the talisman, didn't appreciate the fact that he'd always have a laugh with me and a joke with me, and he wouldn't abuse me. Like, I mean, Bell would come in, huh. and it would, I'd be standing at the non-strikers in going, oh, my word, this is what Shane Warne does to batsmen. <laughs> this is what he must have done to Cullinan. This is what he must have done to all those batters around the world. Like, Ian, Ian Bell was about 12 at the time. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, Belly basically walked out, and it was just, he was gone. Done. As soon as Warney came on, it was just... Just started calling him the Shermanator from American Pie. It was just, it, the, the volley was, I couldn't believe the kind of stuff. But then on the flip side, I'd hit Warney and he'd start laughing. And then I'd run down the other end and I'd just say something to him and he'd start laughing. And I'm sure as the Australians, they must have gone, and I know they did, they must have gone, we can't have this. So after that series, we went down there 18 months later and played the next series. It was a completely different animal. Like he throwing the ball at me and abusing me wow. and hammering me. And we had a big ding dong in Brisbane at the Gabba, um, my favorite place, for um, uh, a, a couple of sessions. And uh, we certainly knew that they meant business that series, just with the way that Warren approached that. And after the series, he just told me, just said, listen, he said, I, I got told uh, in no uncertain terms that. Uh, there was to be no friendliness and there was to be no nicey nicies and we needed to win the series and I needed to be, but, it, but I loved it. I engaged with it. I got runs there. I got 100 in Adelaide. I got more runs um, in Perth. So it properly got me engaged. Wow. Um, 
but we definitely knew, or I definitely knew, there was a different animal there and a different beast, and the results, um, the results showed. I don't, think we, I don't think we won a session. <laughs> we got absolutely hammered. But you know, what you told uh, around, uh, I think a couple of months back, I saw an interview, and you were mentioning about the fact that you use body language effectively on this tour. And, you know, there was something about, you know, guys in the balcony and there was something about, uh, you know, the team sheet exchange. Can you tell us about that? You also played mind games with the Aussies before the tour began. I think, you know, the Aussies are big on, you know, um, the ethics of all as one. And I think, you know, I had my experience of playing against Australia was 2002-03 and we weren't a great team. And we were battered and bruised by that great Australian team. And I felt that they talked down to a lot of our players as well. That was a little bit of motivation on my behalf. I also realised that the senior players in the team back then had just not got the right mentality because they'd been beaten up for such a long period of time. That's why we gambled. You know, we made debut on that first day, uh, Lords in 2005. Ian Bell came as a youngster for Graham Thorpe. So we were willing to go into the 2000 series with a younger, fresher set of minds. And one of the big things for me was making sure that we're on the balcony watching. You know, I wanted the Australians to always look up to the balcony and that balcony was full. You know, I didn't want them to look up and I didn't care if someone was reading a book or not interested in the cricket, just show presence on the balcony. Did it make a difference? Probably not, but I just wanted that as a, as a leader. Um, one of the big things I used to do as a skipper was when you walk out for the toss, I used to, you know, you shake the captain's hand on that occasion, Ricky Pond, and I'd get the team sheet out of my pocket, give it to Ricky and he'd give me his, and I used to just screw it up and put it in my pocket. Now, what, as you crunch it up? Yeah, I used to crunch it yeah, because I didn't want to think that he thought that I needed to look at his team. I used to do it with all the captains, but wow. the problem with Edge Baston when Glenn McGrath. Yeah, is McGrath playing? Yes, I, I, I screwed it up, and then as he was looking away, I went. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I went, oh, he's not playing. Oh, you beauty. <laughs> just check on that one. Yeah, so a little bit of that. It, look, I, I don't think it makes any difference, but I, I think because Australia battered and bruised England pretty much in every series since 86, 87, we had to try anything to prove to them that we were a different team. Awesome. So we'll end this uh, amazing Australia segment with mm. one good sledging or, uh, you know, some major battle with an Australian bowler. Maybe Mitch Johnson, because that is something we remember. Uh, um, it's not really a sledge, per se. Um, I mean, my greatest sledge does come from Australia, and it is with um, one of the War brothers. Uh, it's with Danny War. I mean, if I told you Mitchell Johnson's story, you, it's, it's not really a sledge. But I will tell you the funny, a really funny story. And I played against the Warns, all of them. Play, you played against the best, and you played against the best sledges. This was the best. I was playing grade cricket in Australia in 2000, 2001, and we're playing at Randwick, home of the Wars. The Wars played there. But I was playing with Danny War, who was a left-hander, more talented than Steve and Mark, but just an arty guy, just a guy that just wanted to draw his art, have a few beers, and just get on with it. And he batted six for us. We all went out the night before, as you do, club cricket, grade cricket. We all went out the night before and we um, enjoyed ourselves and we had the most wonderful evening. Um, some of us took ourselves to bed. Danny said, no, 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 I'm going big here. So he had a monster. And <laughs> we came to the ground the next morning and we could see that uh, DW was a monster. And, but it was the flattest wicket in the world. We won the toss, we batted. Our openers got 50 each. I got 60 or 70. Four got whatever, blah, 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 blah. Every single batter scored runs. Danny gets in, we're like, I don't know, I don't know, what, four for 200 or four for 250 or something. Danny gets in in the last passage of play and there's a guy that had been drinking all day um, watching. You just get these guys on his Ford Cortina sitting there with a six pack <laughs> of stubbies and just drinking all day. Danny walks out to bat, plays and misses, plays and misses, and nicks one, plays and misses, plays around a straight one and gets knocked because he hasn't slept. He's walking off the field. Danny walk, better than his brothers, just the most talented. Everybody knew it. The guy shouts from his car, Oi, Danny, are you adopted? <laughs> and the dressing room and everyone just completely broke down. <laughs> completely broke down. Like, so like, like on that wicket, D-Dub should have just walked in there and just played like Lara. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was the best I've ever heard and I've I heard think Warnie at his one best. One of the funniest ledges I've heard. We've checked your mental strength on the show and so many wonderful stories, but now we need to check your physical strength. So we're going to play the hammer game. Where oh. You have to hit the hammer the hardest you can. A lot of records that uh, players have set here. Really? So shall we try? Who's number one? Uh, Rohit Sharma, 919. Okay. Not too sure I'll be getting to that. This is the hammer game. 
any toss for you or you go captain there. this is captain. a good this is a good captain i want you the chance <laughs> and i'm going to bat back first bat back as first. ravi shastri would say this is your chance <laughs> <laughs> very go good it. very good what am i doing just whacking this just whack it wow oh, that's this strong is come on as greggy would say it says go on it's in the air it's got it boy what a fly <laughs> Oh, eight ninety-eight. Eight nine eight. Yeah, I didn't hit it. So I just go one hundred, yeah. just to make it fair. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, Ready? one. This is your. Oh, oh bad. You almost did it. Come on, keep going. Go on. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Go on. Go. Yeah. <laughs> well done. It. Well done. There, there you are, the winner, Michael. Congratulations. Thank you, gentlemen, for that amazing right. performance. Very good. You know football. what we'll be doing now is that uh, we celebrate the duck on the show. So we are going to actually check your ability to draw the duck. Awesome. So you pick the ball early. Let's see if you can hmm. do something here okay. and Let's draw the quick. duck. You ready? Yep. Let's go. This is the way, gentlemen. Hmm. Two famous artists from England. Your time starts now. Mine looks more like a nice, nice. Currently, it looks oh nice, good beak, Michael. <laughs> I got a bit of color involved there, I think. Wow. Blue eyes. Shall I give my duck a blue, blue bit of blue tinge in the eyes? Yes, you can. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> that looks like a seagull, what and is that, that looks like that looks like a chicken. What is that? It's a seagull. Seagull. I just took a reference from there. <laughs>